and as well the entire question of real estate in the future. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to my co-chair, Bob Elliott, um, and then we're going to go around for everyone to introduce themselves, and then Bob will introduce our speaker, Adam. Thanks. Thanks, Gus. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Bob Elliott uh, with Lantian Development, real estate co company based here in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Tuesday monthly meeting. Um, <clears throat> before we self-introduce, i uh, just excited to tell you all about you know, our program today. It's something we haven't done in a few years to try to talk about sort of market leadership sort of post-COVID in real estate, which is kind of an exciting topic for us. And we'll, I'll, I'll introduce Adam here in a second. But um, just really uh, quickly, uh, Brian or Gigi will kind of go around and ask you to turn yourself off of mute. Just give a you know, couple sentences about yourself, who you are, um, what you do. So Adam has a better sense for his audience here today. Thank you. Gigi or Brian, let's turn it over to you real quick. Thank you, Bob. I'm Gigi Godwin, President and CEO of the Chamber. Welcome, everyone. We're very happy to have you. And I'm now turning it over to Brian Levine, our VP of Government Relations. Good morning, everyone. Everyone, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, like Gigi said, this is a welcome to the meeting of the Chamber's uh, Infrastructure and Land Use Committee meeting. And just so you're aware, we are recording this meeting today. Um, and just a couple rules of the road before we get going. I think that uh, the, the speaker Adam Ducker has indicated that it's okay to ask questions um, as he's presenting um, his materials. So. Um, let's do it the way that we know how to do it. You know, raise your hand um, or put something in the chat box and, and we, can, we can get to you um, as soon as possible. Um, so a couple of things, we'd like to take a, a photo of everyone. So I'm gonna take quick photos. So if you wanna turn your camera on, if you're comfortable, I'll do it on, I'll do it on one, I'll do three, two, one, and then we'll take something. So um, uh, here's the warning, you, if everyone is ready, three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so let's go around um, around the room and introduce everyone. Uh, I'll start. I'm, I'm Brian Levine. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, and I'm letting a couple more people into. Um, hi, Latara. Hi, Alexis. We're going around uh, the room and introducing ourselves for, for our speaker, Adam Ducker, today. Uh, again, I'm Brian Levine with the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. Gigi, you want to go next? Um, I'm Gigi Godwin, President and CEO of the Chamber, and uh, I think we should call on people that we can see so that we're efficient. I see Andy Bridge uh, of Eagle Bank. Andy? Hi, I'm Andy Bridge, uh, Eagle Bank, uh, Senior Vice President and Business Development Officer. I'm also the Treasurer of the Chamber. Thank you. And I see Susan Madden of Montgomery College. Good morning, Susan. Actually, Susan's driving. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm parked for the moment, so thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I will get on the road shortly. My name is Susan Madden. I'm with Montgomery College, and thank you for the opportunity to hear this uh, presentation today. Thank you, Susan. And I think uh, I do see Steve Robbins of Lurch Early, former board chair. Steve? Good morning. Steve Robbins. I'm with Lurch Early and Brewer, a law firm in Bethesda. And I'm a former chair of the chamber. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Um, I see, um, I'm hoping I get this right, uh, Marche Taylor. Mm, Templeton, perfect. hello. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Good morning, everyone. I am the new external affairs manager for Baltimore Gas and Electric. So it's very nice to meet everyone. Very nice to have you with us. Thank you. You've always been very active with us. Thanks for joining us today. Um, welcome, Jack Rasmussen. Russell, hello. Thanks for joining us. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm Jack Rasmussen with Russell Insurance Group. I'm the sales manager here. Uh, a large portion of the agency's uh, book is in real estate. So I'm very interested to see uh, what's, what's going on in the real estate business. So thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. I see Mel Tull of Lee Development. Good morning, Mel. Uh, good morning, Gigi. Hi there, Adam. Uh, I'm with Lee Development Group, uh, centered in Silver Spring. We do uh, land development, uh, office buildings, uh, mm -hmm. uh, retail uh, uh, development, and uh, we manage it. So we're very attuned to what's going on in the real estate world. 
Thank you, Mel. I see Mickey Papillon, who is with Federal Realty and also is our co-chair of Legislative Affairs on our Executive Committee of the Board. Mickey? Hi, thanks, Mickey. Good morning, Mickey Papillon, Federal Realty. I handle asset management for Federal's Maryland portfolio. Thank you, Mickey. Chris Carpinito, uh, who is our first vice chair uh, on our uh, executive committee for the board of directors, as well as president and CEO of Cooper Construction. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Gigi. Um, as you mentioned, yes, CEO of Cooper Building Services, uh, federal, state, and local contractor, and um, excited to be here this morning and see the presentation. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Um, I see Kyle Bayless. Kyle, are you on the call? Yeah, yes, I am. Hi, I'm Kyle Bayless. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, the regional director for the Maryland Small Business Development Center at the University of Maryland. Thank you, Kyle. Tammy Watkins of PEPCO. Good morning, Tammy. Good morning, everyone. Tammy Watkins, Government External Affairs for PEPCO. Thank you for being with us, Tammy. And um, I, that is all I can see easily. And Tammy is a member of our board of directors as well. Um, very active with our Public Safety Awards uh, Committee. Thank you. And I, I have completed my list as best I can see. Brian, did we leave anybody? Okay, do we cover everybody? And you got yes. everyone on the phone, right? I believe so. If, if we miss anybody? Yep. Has anybody been missed? I guess that's a better question. If you've been missed, if you can come off me real quick and then we'll move on. Right. Okay, okay. Bob. All righty. Well, um, so uh, Adam Ducker, uh, for those of you in real estate here locally, you probably know Adam or know of Adam because a lot of what his firm does on the consulting end is the underpinning for what we do in the decisions we often make on land development and land use. Adam is nationally known for speaking on the circuit with ULI and ICSC and a bunch of major groups. And the great thing about Adam is he's based here in Bethesda. So he's a local resource for us. He knows everything that's going on macro within the United States and micro. He's been with RCL code too many years to count. Adam would probably know the total number, but I think it's over 20. And in the last year or two, he's been uh, promoted up to CEO of the consulting services business, which I think speaks to Adam's sort of depth of knowledge and experience. So uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Adam as firm a number of years, a number of projects, and they are all great people. And we really, Adam, really appreciate you stopping in today to talk to us and to give us an opportunity to learn about um, your thoughts on the real estate market um, for everybody's base. Adam could talk about almost anything. We have sort of skewed this towards a little bit of residential retail, maybe a touch on office. A lot of it sort of in the post COVID era, macro, micro. If there's some other topic you guys want to dive into, Adam is very well versed in it. We've tried to sort of skew it towards where we think a lot of our members are interested. So that, Adam, I'm going to hand it over to you. You can put up your deck and talk about whatever you want to. And obviously, I know you're free to take questions as we go. So Adam, thank you again for coming today. We really appreciate it. Terrific. Thanks, Bob. What a nice introduction. <laughs> and uh, what a pleasure to be with everybody this morning. By the way, the only thing I'll add to the uh, <laughs> introduction is is I, I live here and although our firm is a national firm, this is actually our headquarters. I, mean, I don't know what headquarters means anymore, but, but we are proud to be based in Montgomery County. And actually, I'm just thinking about it for a minute, you know, there are some towns, including Washington, that are, we kind of call like real estate towns, meaning the real estate community in, in those places sort of like serves not just the local market. Washington has always been a, a real estate town and Montgomery County has, you know, going back maybe 10 or 20 or 30 years ago was, was kind of like the center, <laughs> I think, of, of Washington's real estate economy, at least in terms of where firms were located. I think it's more broadly spread around the region, but, um, but um, it is an important, I think, legacy of the county. Anyway, delighted to be here. I should say, first and foremost, thanks to everybody on the call and so active in the organization, obviously what you do is is vitally important for all for all business owners and and I think for everybody who lives and works in the county and we just appreciate your hard work happy to do a little bit this morning to help the effort and um as Bob said I thought I would speak a little bit or focus a little bit on housing a, a because it's um you know near and dear to my heart and something that we spend a lot of time on but 
But also, I think we have, I'm going to share my screen here. I think we have maybe a slightly unique take on housing, which is, you know, we think it's um, an issue of regional competitiveness. And, and not just in the, I think, too narrow policy discussion of like, is there enough affordable housing? But really in a much broader sense of, is there housing choice? Is there contemporary and compelling housing? Is there kind of a, a, a regulatory environment, an economic environment, you know, a demographic environment in which the changing housing needs of the community are being met? And I think Montgomery County has, has always done a good job of that, but it, it, we may be in a, in, a, in a cycle in which it's harder to keep up. I think maybe one of the things that we'll focus on today is some of the places where we're doing a good job against that goal of housing choice and housing diversity and housing relevancy and other places in which we can you know, do better. And then as, as Bob said, we'll come around at the end to sort of a shorter discussion maybe, but, but still a little bit about retail, which is of course tied to housing and, and the office market, which I think is a big question mark um, for people, not just in Montgomery County, but but here as much as any place else. So that's the plan. I think as um, as folks said, with this group this size, we can keep it very conversational, and and people should not hesitate to just chime in, and um, and ask questions. And we'll spend the next you know hour, or hour and fifteen minutes, or however long we have, and um, happy to do it. I guess the other thing I'll say by way of introduction is, um, who I, by the way, I have the date wrong here. That's embarrassing, but we, we, maybe I can't help it, but we will talk a little bit about demographics. I think it's just so important and it's something we think about a lot. And, you know, I always kind of joke that, uh, you know, in real estate, we wound up talking about the baby boomers and we walk up, wound up talking about the millennials, maybe too much. <laughs> But it really is because they have driven the evolution of housing, and I would argue, real estate over the last 50 years in, in, in America, but, but for sure in Montgomery County. This chart just looks at the last five years of growth. This is the national data, but almost every market in Montgomery County looks the same way, right? And all of the growth really is in two demographic cohorts, the baby boomers, right? They, it's called the baby boom because so many of them were born in the post-World War II you know, period compared to the 50 years prior that it represented just a boom in population. We don't, we don't use the term echo boomers anymore, but that was a term that demograph demographers used for millennials. And, um, and in some ways we can trace the history of Montgomery County to those phenomenons, right? You know, up until World War II, Montgomery County was, you know, a sleepy agricultural place that, you know, happened to be like next door to sort of the sleepy national capital. And it was really the baby boomers, you know, or their parents sort of like attracted to the suburban dream that drove the first kind of like, you know, explosion of housing in the county in the in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, there was sort of a second inflection point in the late 80s as boomers were kind of like driving the early, you know, multifamily and apartment boom in the county. Bethesda Metro opened the 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 office market in Montgomery County and and you know that that has been sort of the like 70 year history of the county whose current you know history is very much tied to the the history of the boomers right you know like in 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 pictures right this is the this is the housing that has served that you know population you know over the last 70 years right you know the sort of like agricultural legacy leading to the like you know, 50s suburban, you know, single family home and apartment. And as the county got kind of richer, um, you know, the housing has grown more sophisticated, typically more urban. And, um, you know, today we have, you know, 
our, our, our experience is, you know, some of the most, you know, compelling and sophisticated housing in the United States in terms of the quality and the, the diversity that, um, you know, presents itself, right? If Montgomery County was the kind of classic suburb, you know, we have seen the, the um, you know, the, the spatial landscape as defined by housing change a lot over that last period of time, right? This is a, this is a, a place type framework that we use to describe places. And, you know, you can, if you can follow the color coding, it gives you a sense of, um, you know, the kinds of places that make up Montgomery County today, which is highly varied, right? We have, you know, a number of non-contiguous or, or disparate urban, you know, centers throughout the county, Bethesda, Silver Spring, you know, parts of Rockville and Sea in the Yellow, and then, you know, suburban place types that range from very affluent, established high-end suburbs on the, um, you know, southwestern corner of the county to, you know, a significant concentration of stable middle-income suburbs. That's not Montgomery's County's, you know, historical, um, you know, kind of first top of mind, but 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 a significant part of uh, of, of the of the facts on the ground and 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 even some economically challenged suburbs as you look towards the eastern county, the map here sort of Prince George's County on the right for comparison, which is interesting, right? Sort of a like a, a different story, but but an interesting story too. And you know what's really happening sort of demographically over the last handful of years in the in in the county and, and where are we going? You know, the short answer is we're getting richer and we're getting older. And that is both an opportunity and a threat. But the, the chart on the left is a little bit misleading because we're, we're not taking just inflation out of the, the growth, right? So to some degree, this is just, you know, the normal pattern of, of people's incomes moving up, but, but, not, but not overwhelmingly. Like we really are getting richer, meaning more high income households um, replacing uh, you know, more, more moderate income households. And the, the charts on the right, I think are, are, are pretty interesting, right? The chart on the top looks at, by the way, this is from um, Montgomery County's just recently published um, regional master plan, which we'll talk about in a minute, but the chart on the right at the top looks at the percentage of the population that is kind of retirement age or older. And um, you can see over the last two decades, just how dramatically Montgomery County has changed and how much older Monk the, the Maryland counties are compared to the Virginia counties. And that is you know, a cause for concern, not so much a cause for concern in the housing market per se, right? But um, you know, I think there is, uh, always a concern about do we have a talented and educated young workforce? By the way, look at the bar chart on the bottom right, right? We talked about, you know, going back to that sort of history of Montgomery County, look at the look at the third 20 to 34 year old cohort, right? That was um, the dark blue is Montgomery County in 1990, right? So more than a quarter of the population were, um, you know, kind of like pre-family stage of life, you know, and today that group is, you know, in their 50s and 60s. And, uh, you know, a relatively, you know, smaller share today. And, um, and again, there, there is a risk. It, it, there, there, on the other hand, to speak of the other side, that you know, I think there is a um, there's a a little bit of like too much. The sky is falling, <laughs> you know, demographic story around just growth in Montgomery County, which is not really well placed. This is actually just 
from the most, this is actual census data for the first time in 10 years, we have like real census data to look at. This is suburban Maryland as a whole, but, but Montgomery County makes up a lot of it. And it's, it's not really true that like over the last 30 years, the growth rate in Maryland and, and by extension Montgomery County has slowed dramatically, right? It's continued to be in this 10 to 15% range you know, for a lot of the last 50 years, a little bit higher in the 80s. And, and it, it is true that Northern Virginia is growing more rapidly. But if you look at the last decade, they're actually pretty close, right? I mean, actually the big changes in the District of Columbia. But, but this is actually a pretty healthy regional growth pattern where really all parts of the region are growing at a similar rate. And then maybe just one last slide, and then I'll stop for a second, which is, um, okay, great, right? We have growth. Like, what, what constitutes the growth in, in our county? And, um, you know, there's, there's three things, right? This, this, I wish this is actually a little bit of old data. This is actually from the 2010 census. It would be terrific if, if, there's a tool that lets us do this again, but it shows in the blue lines where people moving to Montgomery County are coming from. And in the red arrows, where people are leaving Montgomery County are going to. And, and it's not an unhealthy picture, right? If you look at the places where people are coming from, they're the high education, you know, white collar workforce markets, right? You know, just the West Coast, Seattle, the Bay Area, Southern California, Chicago, Minneapolis, and then, you know, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. These are the like, this is where the educated, you know, workforce, you know, is, is, is kind of like has started their career. And a lot of that moving to the county is people sort of moving here to settle down and, um, you know, start a family and their career. And then you know, where are people going to the red arrow? Like they're mostly going to, you know, lower cost markets, either for retirement or for a break on cost of living and something of the like. Now, the, the actual moving in and moving out, if you look at the bar chart above it, is, is pretty even. It's sort of like almost like a wash year over year. And, and so the growth is coming from, um, you know, two, 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 two sources, right? Like we have a lot of international migration. The pie chart on the right looks at the distribution of, of Montgomery County by foreign born um, or domestic. And that's a big number, 33%, right? I think there is a, um, of that, that is really the source of the diversity in Montgomery County. Montgomery County is sort of emerging as an immigration magnet. You know, for those of us who live in the western part of the county, I think sometimes it's easy to forget. But um, it's pretty dramatic. And, and of course, you know, growth comes from, you know, household formation and, and natural births. I didn't bring the, the data, but, but people are probably familiar with or have tracked the enrollment numbers in Montgomery County, um, which have risen not dramatically, but consistently over the last 10 years, 10 really 10 to 15 years. By the way, it's interesting, just in the last few weeks, there has been some press about this is the first year, and I think it's 15 years that enrollment in the county's public schools didn't go up, right? And, you know, to some degree, that can be, you know, tied back a little bit to that millennial story too, right? The millennials are I think we still sort of equate with 20 somethings. The reality is that like most of them are now in their thirties and, and, and move into Montgomery County in, in meaningful measure. And may, maybe the, the, the sort of like crest has arrived, meaning like the, just the growth in school age children is here, but that's a topic for another day perhaps. But let me pause for a second. We're gonna go on to real estate, but, but any kind of discussion or comments or questions about kind of the demographics of the county or what's sort of changing, you know, beneath the hood, if that's the way to think about demographics. And I'm ask one thing, two things real quick. One, you mentioned the fact that the county didn't see growth 
in the public school system this past year. I'm wondering whether any of that could be attributed to COVID yeah. and or whether or not looking for different sources and if we see private school growth now, and then ultimately we're in, you know, in a, a fairly good economic situation at the moment, which allows for people to be looking at these private school education opportunities. And then, you know, what has tended to happen, unfortunately, in these times when, you know, if we happen to hit, you know, go, in, go into a recession, people pull their kids from these schools, and then ultimately the, the public school component swells again. So I'm wondering if there's any of that. So that one, yeah. one, that's the first question. The second question was the around Maryland component, you identified the fact that our population as a percentage of older population seems to be growing at a more rapid rate than Virginia as a percentage. Is that because Virginia has grown better on the lower end or are more people in Maryland staying around longer? And I, I question that, but, and I'm wondering that because Maryland is often flagged as one of the worst places to retire. And I'm, you know, as opposed to, and you see the outbound people going to Texas and Florida, places that have no income tax um, for, you know, the state level. So I'm just wondering, you know, so two, two things there, one yeah. about schools and the second about the Maryland lack of migration or is it growth in Virginia that's causing that, so. Yeah. Um, maybe to take the schools question first, you know, public, private school enrollment in the county has actually been dipping a little bit over the last decade or so. And so it, it, there has not really been this tectonic shift from, or even meaningful shift from public school education to private school education. I mean, the county has great private schools and our, and our level of private school enrollment is relatively high or, or similarly high to like other affluent Northeastern suburbs. And I, I understand that there was a little bit of a blip in 2020, like, you know, in the face of COVID people moved to private schools, but I don't, I think it was not more than a blip. And I don't believe that that's what's sort of driven the, the um, kind of the, like maybe the cresting last year, but, but I'm okay. not an expert in that. Yeah, well, that's I mean, it's obviously watching. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I think, you're right. This is largely the grain of the existing population, right? Like, meaning, you know, the boomers are staying and not retiring to Florida, maybe in quite the same numbers as they did, you know, a decade or two ago, which is probably a good thing. By the way, it it also may, it also may. It, I, I wonder, like, there there may be, you know, a similar number of boomers that are spending the winter someplace else, but, but this is still their primary place of residence. But to answer your question, like, we're just not, you know, we're just not, you know, the, the people that are 65 today, like they, they were 35, 30 years ago. And I think Northern Virginia suburbs are just replacing that, you know, young, young professional and just young population at a greater rate than Montgomery County is, you know, either because the jobs are there or because the perceived quality of life is there, I think largely because the jobs are there. And, um, you know, Montgomery County's legacy was as a bedroom community. I think in the 70s and 80s, we were um, in a very good place in terms of, 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 of actually being, you know, a live, a live, work, play community, right? Meaning like, a, a, like it really was, you know, a self-contained economic unit. And, you know, I think there's a risk that the county kind of begins to, to morph into being a little bit of a bedroom community. And maybe despite the tax conditions, you know, not a retirement community and like people move here to retire, but like, you know, a place that, that, that feels a little bit more, you know, mature or a little bit more, right? I mean, I think the other, the other analogy that's been in the back of my mind is some people describe this phenomenon of, as being like what's happening in California, like as a state, right? Like it's so unaffordable, but the quality of life is so good that it's kind of becoming, you know, people use the term, you know, playground for the rich. I don't think Montgomery County is at risk of becoming a playground for the rich or certainly not the community broadly speaking. But I do think that like, and actually we're gonna come back to this, but maybe we'll flip ahead. I mean, 
some of some of this um well just to look at one thing for a second i kind of remembered this as i was um as i was you know thinking about you know housing choice and and what helps people think about montgomery place county is a place they want to work and live like this was a a, a report that this task force on the nighttime economy did you know i was surprised to see it was nine years ago I actually went back and leafed through it last night it's worth picking up <laughs> i think they really hit on a bunch of things that are in fact like disincentive for the kinds of like robust you know social cultural you know like nighttime experiences that that maybe have attracted people to neighborhoods in the district only young people in particular but maybe all people it, it it would be interesting to like you know encourage the county to like revisit this by the way i'm not sure it needs so much revisiting maybe just freshening it up and beginning to like bring it back Um, anything else before we kind of get into a little bit into real estate or, or jobs, maybe, I guess, is what we're, what we're kind of talking about, whether this is, this is, I thought I, I, I missed, I thought I had put Montgomery County data in here, but, but the, the job story is, is very similar, right? And I think this, this people know, right? This is the, this is the, the jobs transformation that the region in Montgomery County has gone through, which is, you know, from a, um, you know, kind of a, a government town with this, you know, like sleepy, but, and, and, and very mixed economy, tele economy that's really driven by, you know, business and professional services and, um, you know, education and, uh, you know, healthcare services now like terrific, right? High paying jobs, high quality jobs. Um, you know, lots, lots of, of, of reason for people to move here, want to live here. And then we kind of, we kind of like this, this visualization of where jobs are in the region. And, you know, the color coding kind of hits on some of those categories that we, we highlighted, um, you know, which is the, 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 the blue, for professional services and that green for healthcare. And I, I, I was, I'm always surprised to look at this map in Montgomery County, you know, and in particular, you know, focusing on just how much of the employment is, um, you know, up county, right? That's, that's the, 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 the healthcare and biotech cluster you know, in, in kind of, you know, Rockville to Gaithersburg here, I guess I'll highlight with my, my, my cursor. And, um, you know, a, a, quite a bit of employment still in, you know, kind of Rock Springs, the, the cluster. And I think maybe I'm wondering if other people are the same, right? In my mind, <laughs> the like employment in Montgomery County is, is, heavily concentrated in, in places like, you know, Bethesda and Silver Spring and even downtown Rockville, which is here. And it's really fairly disaggregated. And in fact, more disaggregated than Northern Virginia, which I think is surprising because in my mind, Northern Virginia is like, you know, the like employment, particularly the office using employment just sprawls out, you know, the Dulles tollway corridor and sprawls out that the, 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 the 50 corridor and 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 it's it's actually you know somewhat more concentrated than it is in Montgomery County and you know that's I think that's a risk right I mean like there there is I think a sense of you know the 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 270 corridor you know business parks and and the Rock Springs style development is not so resonant with, you know, where, where, you know, 21st century employers, like, you know, think they're most competitive for employees. So I think there's some, there will be some work to be done in terms of, 
you know, continuing to, to kind of, you know, develop office inventory, not so much, we'll come back to this maybe in a little bit, not so much to sort of accommodate a tremendous amount of growth in, you know, office using employment or, or, or net need for office space, but, but just in terms of, um, you know, accommodating that workforce, you know, in, in metro rich locations that we, our sense is that metro will continue to be kind of a driver of value and important for people and in walkable amenitized locations. So something worth thinking about. Anyway, um, housing, right? So this is, this is again, Washington DC, but I suspect it speaks to Montgomery County and We'll have something on the following screen. Look at which is just looks at the change in occupied households by by the tenure, right? And you sort of see at the left, like big change in renter occupied housing and owner households on the right, which is only growth among high income households, right? And I think this is. You know, th this is kind of the story in Montgomery County too, right? Which is, you know, like interestingly enough, like these two cohorts, you know, seventy-five to one hundred thousand and one hundred thousand to one hundred fifty thousand. That's 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 middle class in Montgomery County, almost by definition. The middle one third of households, you know, earn in that roughly seventy-five thousand to one hundred fifty thousand, and you know that that cohort is growing largely as as renter cohorts and and the the upper third of the economy are are over are are, are significantly growing as owners but 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 some of them as renters too if you look at the top bar on the right and this is not different than the region but this is this is an interesting um map that that, that a colleague of, of mine put together, which looked at home buying, right? What, what was the change in occupied households in the 20 to 2010 range? And you can see it's actually fairly, well, just that there's no key here, I apologize. The darker red is more, more transactions. And if you just compare the map at the right, which is the change in the number of owner occupied households, you can see just how much less change there is. And in Montgomery County in particular, I mean, you know, you can see there's sort of dark red on the, on the, on the suburban fringe of the county, you know, the Northwest and the Northeast County, you know, in, in both time periods, like that's just where the last little bit of, you know, greenfield developable land has been in the county. But but it's interesting, like there's just a lot more, you know, dark color down county and central county in um, in the 2000, 2010 period than there has been in the last decade or so. We, we kind of are, you know, getting to the point and it's, I'm not sure that it's a terrible condition, right, where, where you know, certainly close in and commutable housing is, is um, you know, really like only affordable to that, you know, upper third, and maybe it's even the upper 25% of the county by population. I'm going to flip ahead. By the way, this is, oh, I have a typo in there. This is a little bit interesting. It looks at the right. I sort of adjusted this for, for, um, you know, Montgomery County, again, that that middle class household in Montgomery County, 80 to 160% of median income or the third of the incomes of 750 to $150,000. In Montgomery County, right, that's really people who can afford to spend 450 or 500,000 to $650,000 on a home. And that is hard to find you know, really in most parts of the county today. Interestingly, you know, one of the, one of the like real estate buzzwords that, you know, has sort of emerged around this 
question of, you know, attainable housing or middle income housing is sort of missing, missing middle. You'll hear this term missing middle housing. And it describes housing that's middle in terms of demographically oriented towards, um, you know, the middle income households, middle meaning it's, it's um, you know, middle stage of life, you know, young families, first time home buyers, and also middle meaning, um, you know, middle densities, right? Maybe, maybe acknowledging that it's gonna be hard to um, deliver, you know, detached homes for people in that, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar price range, but but that there should be a way, and actually this is the county study in the middle, which is worth taking a look at, right? It does sort of describe, you know, some of the obstacles towards redeveloping a lot of the kind of like closer in middle density portions of the county. That that would be kind of worth um, you know, the chamber taking a look at. It would be something to champion. And I think it did play a role in really driving the Thrive Montgomery County plan that is, um, you know, just, just kind of out now. I, I think getting some good buzz, although also, um, you know, getting some negative reaction. And I think the plan is is grappling with a lot of the things that we're talking about, right? How do we put, you know, some of these middle density, you know, close in transit rich, you know, communities where the density is really moderate, you know, the Georgia Avenue corridor, the the um, you know, Veers Mill corridor, this this these maps sort of describe this framework of large centers, medium centers, smaller centers, and um, removing barriers to, you know, redevelopment and densification and the expansion of housing options in some of those communities. One of the things that the plan grapples with that, that other communities like Montgomery County grapples with is, um, you know, the zoning legacy around single family housing you know, single family zoning is one of the things that's made it very, very difficult to kind of redevelop vast swaths of the county outside of, you know, the really urban areas. And, um, you know, some of the, some of the, the, the negative energy around the Thrive Montgomery plan has been, you know, around kind of like seeming to, to, to problematize or, or even, you know, suggest like moving away from single family housing is like a zoning ordinance that can never change. And um, that would be that would be a game changer. Like if by right, you know, single family neighborhoods could be developed at um, a variety of densities. By the way, I don't know if, if, if the chamber has kind of engaged with the plan yet or the authors of the plan, but it would be it would be something worth doing, or at least this committee might do that. And we do that on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. We talked to Casey and Gwen and right. been involved in discussing the various pieces, both around TOD, thoughts around, you know, what is or isn't Greenfield, how the impacts yeah. of this impact schools and growth, et cetera. So we probably every three to six months Good. have checked in with Casey and the group on that. Right. So. I mean, I think one of the one of the housing friendly or maybe growth friendly um you know, like 20 year struggles or at least 10 year struggles was around the accessory dwelling unit discussion, which, you know, sort of like on again, off again. And I mean, I think it does seem like where the county has wound up in terms of the accessory dwelling unit, um, you know, ordinance, I think is in a good spot and, and is in fact like growth friendly, housing friendly, um, and you know, makes it kind of uh, you know puts us in a good spot. You know, one of the one one of the one of the I think challenges is 
and actually I was on that missing middle task force that I talked about earlier. One of the you know, challenges is that you know, zoning is an important tool of sort of creating a condition and where you know, innovation and housing can happen, right? But, but the entrepreneurial class to sort of like figure it out and try it you know, needs to exist to make it happen too. And, you know, I guess if we're honest, it, it, you haven't seen the like bubbling up of, you know, home builders, small developers, you know, sort of like trying to take advantage of or capitalize on, you know, the ADU changes or, you know, kind of like that I see looking at, you know, the sort of like, you know, maybe new zoning ordinances and single family neighborhoods in Maryland. So I think one of the, the, the questions that we should ask is, you know, how do we, how do we support, you know, the housing entrepreneurs in our community? And, you know, I mean, I don't know how we support them, right? I mean, it's not like, it's not, it's not a charitable class, but, but, you know, that would be interesting to sort of explore. Like if, if innovation comes from entrepreneurial developers, like how do we support that group of people? Hi, Adam. Um, it's Latara Harris with at and yeah. Thanks for sharing all of this great information. I have, you have a ton more. Um, you know, I was trying to thumb quickly through the 147-page report that Brian put in the chat, and I do remember when County Executive Leggett was doing uh, that work and that task force and trying to attract um, younger, uh, you know, uh, I remember we were part of the conversations trying to attract younger audiences and nightlife and so forth. And as I was going through it, it was almost, it seemed as, it was, as if it was almost void of the technologies that were to come. This report was, back, you know, put, yeah. was, uh, was put together back in 2013. And as you have, you know, eloquently sort of uh, displayed today, the density of what we have seen in Montgomery County and for my industry, um, the work that we're doing on, um, on you know, responding to that and developing the advanced technologies through smarter cities and smarter technologies and so forth. Um, I'm just curious from your perspective, one, I know that you're doing, you know, this report on housing. Are we seeing more uh, folks wanting to invest in smarter technologies in their housing? Are you using that as a marketing plea? You know, that as well. And then secondly, um, my other question was about the Ike Leggett report, and do you think that that is resurfacing in some other of these task force forces that you're seeing? And if that is the case, are they incorporating technology? No, it's a handful, yeah. but I'll put that out yeah. there. You know, I think I think my my sense of it is that around the United States, like housing producers have been slow to like really move aggressively into technology as a, you know, a differentiating force, or at least have been like on the vanguard of like really pushing like towards the tip of the sphere in terms of technology, right? So like, you know, you see like sensible, not like aggressive, you know, innovations in terms of technology, whether that's green technology or just connectivity. And um, I would say Montgomery County is, is not much better and not much worse, right? Meaning like if there's a tech enabled housing of the future, like I wish I could say it was being pioneered here. By the way, it could be, right? We actually have a like very sophisticated tech economy and, and tech entrepreneurs in our community, but I don't really sort of see it. And then, you know, your second question is a good one, right? Which is like, you know, in this broader like context of making Montgomery competitive or compelling towards, you know, younger households or, or you know, highly educated or workforce is, is technology a potential driver? And that may be, I mean, I think one of the things that people are asking and what we should talk about in a minute, right, coming out of COVID is, um, you know, just how profound will the, decoupling of, of life and work become, right? Like that's been our destiny for the last 50 years, right? You either like live where you work or you spend a lot of your life commuting and, and that might change for some people. And I think for places like Montgomery County, right? Assuming that there will be a more, you know, 
live live where you want to live workforce but maybe there's some benefit to being near the economic or intellectual energy that's you know metropolitan washington dc like i think thinking about how housing how the competitive is how the county is competitive in that kind of you know more hybrid work setting like could include technology right if 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 housing or just the infrastructure of the county in terms of you know technology green living like cost of living was was very much on the forefront that might be a competitive advantage and i think you know today we would consider our housing diversity a competitive advantage but we need to stay ahead of that okay. i don't know if that then, answered your question yeah it does but are, are there commissions or efforts that you're seeing now that is bringing that message into the fold or you're no not really not much <laughs> okay not much okay. All right, I appreciate that. If yeah. you know, I think with the chamber, if you can kind of keep us posted, if if we can help in bringing that message to bear, mm -hmm. especially as because your numbers tell a story that often is challenging for us as an industry to articulate. Listen, it's density, and we can't keep up with the number of people and the technology that we currently have. Whereas you tell that story, um, and we can't continue, you know, use the, the older technology. So I, I would appreciate figuring out how we can make sure that message is uh, in sync. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good, 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 good discussion. I mean, Adam, one of, yeah, Adam, I was just wondering if I could just chime in um, uh, to follow up with Latera's question, because I, I appreciate, you know, the whole sense of, well, you know, where is this taking us? And, you know, a lot of the data, I mean, there is great data here. And and then there's going to be all this new data that's post census and post pandemic. And how what what now that we've seen this change, all these changes kind of where is it taking us and and the degree to which we can, you know, connect up our uh, you know, our concerns about broadband and infrastructure. I mean, fortunately, the, finally, we've got the, the president's infrastructure bill has been passed. More money, we hope, goes into, you know, broadband. We're going to yeah. need that everywhere because the world the world was changing and the pandemic right. just accelerated that change. And people are going to be doing more from their homes. And so, you know, not only are our homes, you know, is the land use community taking this as an opportunity to drive you know, sort of their positioning to, you know, you need new new housing, new updated housing that has greater technology. I mean, there's such an opportunity here. Um, and there's such an opportunity to, to have a, a sort of a sense of placemaking, um, you know, to don't waste a good crisis. We just had one, you know, how, how, how are our placemakers taking what we now um, have seen that people want to do and employers want to do? And employees yeah. want to do um and then using that leveraging that to to help our community i mean all communities i hope the whole nation gets with the program on this but we're talking about montgomery county today and so you know that i think the thing is a lot of people are looking at the what's next you know yeah. now that i know this what do i know and how is that changing that the policies we're going to advocate for i mean this is what the chamber is very interested in is the latest data the where are we going what's you know how do we bring up you know uh the, the kind of concerns latera at t and and our communications partners have uh, as well as the opportunities and the brain power that the land use community has thank you yeah well said we're going to talk a minute about apartment construction. I think apartments and and delivery of not just high quality, but like a diverse um, like array of apartments has been, I think, one of the county's successes in the last, you know, couple of real estate cycles. By the way, this is an interesting map. The dots show apartment construction, both in Montgomery County and Prince George's County by decade. And you can actually see I mean, if you kind of look at the blue dots, right, those are more or less all metro stations. I mean, that's been a major policy push of um, planning in the county to concentrate development near transit. Very, very effective, maybe, maybe too effective, right? Oh, and I only say that because it does sort of tend to push the product towards higher 
higher density, higher intensity, higher cost um, product. But but you know, actually, like the the affordability of of new construction in the county and in the region has not been bad. This is a little tough, maybe a little bit hard for folks to process, but we did this analysis where we looked at um, you know, what percentage of newly delivered housing in, in these regions was what sometimes people call workforce housing, right? Non-subsidized housing but affordable to households making less than 100% of you know, the median income, right? So not, not the top half of um, the population by income. And you know, the chart shows mostly what you would expect, right? Low cost markets like Charlotte and Dallas and Baltimore, you know, actually are delivering a fair amount of rental housing for that cohort. And high cost markets like Boston and Miami and Oakland and are delivering not very much, but you have to look at Washington, it's fairly high, right? Actually 40% of the housing we delivered in the region now, I don't know for a fact, but I bet Montgomery County is relatively similar, right? So we have the advantage of high incomes, right? So 80 to 100% of my income in the county could be, again, households in that 70 to $100,000 range, but, but we really are delivering more housing, non-subsidized housing, non-inclusionary zoning driven housing for, for the workforce than most high cost markets, which is, which is pretty compelling. Or I think something to, um, you know, to sort of celebrate and be proud of. By the way, I mean, when I didn't, I didn't bring any of this data, but when we look at, you know, affordability data, rental housing affordability data, or um, you know, rent burden data. You know, M Montgomery County actually scores relatively well. So I don't want to, don't want to like, you know, say that there's no reason to be concerned about affordable housing. I think you know that's a good discussion, but I think there's a slightly more nuanced view of like we're actually providing a fair amount of um, or a fairly varied. Housing, at least in terms of um, you know who 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 the housing targets on the rental housing front and the like. W one other element that I think you know the real estate industry is grappling with, and suburban counties like Montgomery County are grappling with, is the idea of family-friendly rental housing, right? Which is you know lots of 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 families are, are, are renters in Montgomery County and, and in, across Washington, DC. And, and a lot of them live in conventional multifamily, but a lot of them live in you know, lower density rentals, right? So there's been a, a lot of energy over the last couple of years in the build for rent space in you know, the real estate community in the United States, actually building rental townhome communities or, or single family for rent communities. This chart kind of looks at where some of those existing communities and more recently built communities are around the region. And the, 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 the inventory and the numbers are pretty low. Actually, we have a, a client who is looking at an upcountry site for you know, rental townhome product. And the entitlement process has been, um, has been challenging. Um, you know, I, I think Montgomery County, actually really all of the suburban um, Washington counties have a little bit of this, like, you know, townhomes is, is not the kind of sub development pattern that we like, but, but I think in this case, this really is, you know, family workforce housing. And it will be interesting to see how this kind of plays out over time, something to think about. I'm gonna skip over a few things here and then maybe we um, should talk about retail. And, you know, kind of like the way we talked about where the existing concentrations of office are, um, 
you know, this, this heat map, which sort of shows the, the bright areas are the high concentrations of retail. And again, you know, I think, you know, in, in, our, in a lot of our minds, right, when we think about the retail inventory of Montgomery County, it's, you know, these kind of like sexy, more, you know, more urban places, um, you know, including federal realties projects around the county. But, you know, the reality is that like a lot of the retail is still, you know, up and down Rockville Pike and, you know, on some of the county's major cross county connectors and highly, um, highly disaggregated. The county actually, by the way, I should also say Montgomery County has weathered COVID or the retail markets have weathered COVID like quite well relative to kind of other counties around the United States, right? I, I, I don't have the data at my fingertips, but when you look at the like the business closings or the change in occupancy rate, not to say that COVID has been painless for the owners and operators of retail businesses, it's been quite painful for any of them, but, but we have weathered it like surprisingly well. And I think that's largely because the county, um, you know, real estate markets are, are pretty balanced. This was a, a retail market study that the county did in 2020, which was actually pretty good. And, um, you know, the, I think the reason why the retail markets have held up relatively well, if you look at that chart at the lower right, is like we're, we're just not as over retailed as some, you know, suburban counties around the United States. Just this simple metric of square feet of, of retail per capita at 24 is pretty healthy. There are a lot of suburban counties around the United States where the, where the ratio is in the 30s, meaning 30 square feet per person. And like you, you see more vacancy. You know, what we don't see in Montgomery County that really is the sign of retail weakness is, you know, the like giant picked up and moved across the street and the old giant box is empty. We really don't have that phenomenon. One, one of the things that's, that's, that is, is missing a little bit or was a little bit off on this, um, on this analysis that the county's consultant did on the left is it shows you know, future demand in blue and you know, current supply in yellow and it suggests that there's like a mismatch, but it's not, it's not really a, a, a like, a, a, like a, a particularly like logical way to think about it because you know people people travel to to shop <laughs> and particularly i think one of the like one of the nuances of our retail pattern is the retail is much more highly aggregated in montgomery county than other places right the map sort of shows it but you know there are just large swaths of like up county west county where there's very very little retail and people you know, drive to, you know, the retail concentration, not just for sort of like destination shopping, but, but even for some of their, you know, convenience and, and almost sort of daily good shopping. And I think that's left, that's right. So, you know, if this suggests that like demand is much higher than supply, you know, in, in some of these places, it's, it's just as much driven by the like people moving in and out to, um, you know, to shop. You know this 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 again 2020 this was probably pre-covid countywide vacancy rate of about 6.8 percent i think it's fairly similar i don't think it is tracked up much as a result of COVID. although if anybody else on the call is even closer to the retail market i'd be kind of curious to hear what people what people observe You know, over the last two decades, you know, retail has gotten, or what what new retail has been added to the county's, um, you know, the the county's supply has been has been really in a fairly urban format, right? And sort of thinking about, 
you know, places like the Pike District and, and places like, you know, downtown Rockville, where, um, you know, the retail that's been added has been really like destination and character, walkable, you know, lifestyle oriented. And I think that has, you know, helped us weather the storm fairly well, right? People are going there for quality and for experience. And we just haven't seen the like, you know, one more, you know, grocery anchored shopping center sort of like chasing the household. It's just the county zoning hasn't really allowed it. Um, and even, you know, some of our, you know, suburban shopping centers, you know, Cabin John, you know, only, you know, where, where there's been, you know, I think a very healthy pattern of reinvesting, um, preserving the relevance of, you know, enhancing the aesthetics or, 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 or just character of suburban retail. I think that has, has, has really helped keep our retail markets um, both healthy and, and, and relatively resilient through COVID. Any questions or thoughts or observations about kind of the county's retail markets? Yes, I have one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wondered why it's kind of interesting to know that we're getting older and richer. Um, but, you know, a lot of the very high end um, uh, labels are not here. You know, yeah. a lot of people in Montgomery County go to Tyson's too, to Galleria to if they want, you know, the really high end stuff. And yeah. you know, so we have people who could afford it, but we're missing out on the sales tax because we don't actually have those stores here. So I just wondered, you know, I mean, what is the demographic driving that? So, I mean, somebody must be making the decision that it's not a good investment to put those stores here. And not only that, I've noticed that Nordstrom's has sort of shrunk at Montgomery Mall, um, not in square footage, but in terms of what's inside the square footage. They don't, they don't carry the same things that they used to carry. And you have to go to Virginia for a lot of that stuff. Anyway, I just wondered what your thoughts are based yeah. on on uh, how do you how do you square those two different pieces of information? Yeah, thanks. It's, it's a really it's a really good question. You know, there's a great real estate story. I believe it's true. Um, when the Chevy Chase Land Company, by the way, you know, one of Montgomery County's like legacy real estate institutions and our families anyway, um, developed the Chevy Chase Pavilion, the the like. The, that, you know, very high end destination retail GG that you're speaking to in um, the, early, the middle, early middle 2000s, you know, the story goes that a couple of, of high end retailers, you know, you know, the original lineup was, you know, Gucci and Hermes and Ralph Lauren had actually come to them and a significant amount, not a high percentage, but like a meaningful amount of sales that some of those high-end operators were experiencing in their New York City stores were coming from Southern Montgomery County. So in other words, some of those retailers had actually come to the land company interested in being in Southern Montgomery County. And, you know, the, the like, the, 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 the quirky, like, history to your question, gee, is like that, that, that failed, that development, right? Those tenants did not lease, you know, live past one lease term and, um, and they haven't renewed and they're being replaced with other kinds of retail. And you know, we, we've really gone to one mall in the county and, and it's, it's a very good mall, but it's not a fashion destination. And um, I think there are, there are two things that have happened, right? Number one is, you know, the district has just like captured what local market there is. Um, and that high end retailing has moved downtown. And partly that's because some of that, um, you know, very affluent spending was coming out of Northwest DC and, and you know, it was being captured in Mother Southern Montgomery County. And I think second, you know, people in Montgomery County have just been like happy enough to like spread some of that spending around, including in the District of Columbia. And like, it's just not really created enough energy to keep it in Montgomery County. 
I think the other thing that both the district and Tyson's have that Montgomery County just doesn't have is a lot of that retail is supported by, you know, destination spending, like you really do here, that, you know, people come and, you know, stay, you know, but like affluent customers, even from outside the United States, come and stay in Tyson's and shop at, you know, those malls and that supports the like boutique retail and the same thing is happening downtown. So we've really never had that pattern of like people coming here from overseas or at least from other markets, you know, staying and shopping. And it's just made it too hard to keep up. And I, I just have to say, I agree with you on the, oh, by the way, the, the direct non-stops to Dulles from yeah, Dubai that's... and London. Um, and, you know, you see those shoppers at four o'clock on Saturday and there they are. And so we're really missing out on discretionary spending by the world's travelers by not having um, a mall with a high end hotel, you know, that is that is here. And yeah. I, I think that those pieces, I agree that those pieces fit together. Thanks, yeah. Adam. I think the other Ad, thing that Adam, can I, Adam, yeah. can I say something? Please, please. Um, um, you mentioned the high end shopping and um, the it was actually the collection. Right, the collection. It's right, right. Right. not not um, Chevy yeah, Chase, right. going, although that mall also did not do very well. Yeah. So um, and is still trying to figure out what it what it should be. Um, actually, I think they're doing residential there now. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Um, being involved in the Friendship Heights sector plan early on in the um, mid 90s, all the way to like 1998, and then representing um, the May Department Stores Company and then New England Development in Wisconsin Place. Um, and then also now working with the Chevy Chase Land Company. Um, I can tell you that um, I think one of the major problems associated with Friendship Heights, and hopefully it will come back and get together, especially when the count when the county uh, takes another look at the sector plan, is that there was such a uh, a um, conscious attempt to hold down the levels of development in Friendship Heights yeah. because of community involvement and people obsessing on the issue of too much traffic at Western and Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which never proved to be the case. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. um, and as a result, um, there was never a critical mass that could be that could be generated between <clears throat> Wisconsin places retail and the land companies retail. And of course, um, the third major player in that whole um, trivecta was Geico, which, you know, decided to just sell insurance and leave their campus the way it is. So as a result, there was never that there there that was yeah. created because the commercial density was held down um, to really un candidly unacceptable levels. Uh, I mean, I remember one time we tried to get a few kiosks over at Wisconsin Place but we've maxed out on the retail density and the county was just like, you know, sector plan is what it is. Um, and so I think the county needs to take another look at Friendship Heights. It's got yeah, the sure. potential to be great, but it needs, it needs, you know, a significant boost in density to be able to create, create that there, there, because it's much more walkable, frankly, than Tyson's. Yeah. Uh, but Tyson's has, you know, the, the all, all has enough density to create that mass that people like Gigi said, where they come in and you said it is a destination. They have people there that come in and spend a ton of money and leave. Yep. I think, yes. I think the other, it's certainly true in Friendship Heights, but I think it's another problem in the county or maybe to Gigi's Question, one of the things that rankles me is I hate, <laughs> you know, reading the lists of 50 best restaurants in the region and so few of them are in Montgomery County. You know, the Michelin stars come out and none of them are here. And, you know, that's something that we have more, that we have more control over. I think the county's liquor laws do not help. The like, you know, regulatory complexities do not help, you know, 
like it, I, I'm not suggesting that we should be in the business of <laughs> subsidizing restaurants, but I think where where the fun and good places to eat is like a driver of where people want to go and you know see and be seen and shop and maybe even live. And um, I would be delighted if in ten years that was a different story. Maybe one last question, which is about, um, you know, what's happening with office space and what's going to happen with office space and what does that mean to the county? I mean, I think for what it's worth, although Washington is actually at the low end of this list in terms of, you know, back to the office, but that's just really kind of a reflection of the kind of employment we have, right? You know, New York is and Washington are very similar, right? You know, we, we have like a super highly educated, you know, white collar workforce, and that's proven to be the workforce that can, you know, be very effective remotely. But I think, you know, what, what has happened is there's a trickling up in terms of like people being back in office buildings that's happened over the last couple of months, probably you know, delayed by, you know, the Delta variant, but, you know, it's slow. And, you know, I think our sense, our sense as a firm or the, the reading we do, you know, suggests that, um, you know, there, 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 there will be a new normal in terms of like how, how much of the workforce is remote. It's not going to go to a hundred percent and and it was actually surprisingly low. I mean, pre-COVID, most economies had, you know, something like seven, eight percent of the economy were remote workers, not not more than that. And that will that will trickle up, but it's not going to go to 30 or 50 percent. But 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 what does seem likely to happen is, you know, a workforce that is in a hybrid mode for a long time, if not, you know, forever. And that does put downward pressure on um, just the demand for office space, right? If, 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 if companies are, I think, you know, continue to see that, you know, there are a lot of empty desks, a lot of days a week, it will really push like occupiers of office space to revisit how much space they need is a flexible or hoteling like setup, you know, really supportive of um, the kind of office density we're getting um, so there's a change afoot with, and the only caveat I'll add is, I think it's likely to happen slowly. I always tell the story like our lease here at 7200 Wisconsin Avenue expired this past winter. And, you know, we, we did what everybody else seems to want to do, which is like we extended. <laughs> we don't, we didn't want to deal with it. We didn't know how to deal with it. And so we just decided to stay put probably with too much space to begin with. And, you know, I think that's a decision people are going to make. Leases roll very slowly. So it may take a long time for this to pan out. In our sense of, uh, of, of what is going to happen in the office market was in some ways already happening pre-COVID, right? Which is, it was becoming an industry of winners and losers. And you saw that in Montgomery County, right? Like, you know, great new buildings in downtown Bethesda were charging very high rents and getting them. And pretty good buildings in off locations were charging very low rents and struggling to find, just struggling to find tenants. <laughs> so, you know, like in, in a future in which office space is about brand and about gathering and about, you know, image and culture and not so much about just, you know, the number of desks, it, it, it does suggest that, you know, really great office and really great locations will will do just fine and you know buildings that were struggling with relevance either the physical product or the location or the amount of services you know will struggle that much more going forward adam a quick question so your belief right now is that the 
this, I guess this is speaking more to professional sectors generally, right? Not to retail and a whole bunch of other things, but that the office concentration is really only at about 37% nationally. This is just, this is the occupancy, meaning like what percentage of people who like had a desk prior to COVID are using that desk on a regular basis? I don't know, it's, anecdotally, that just seems low to me. I mean, again, I everybody's a little bit different in this process, yeah. but you know, I look at roads, I look at traffic, I, you know, retail is still down at restaurants during the day over lunchtime, but um, doing things on the weekend and it's like, seems like people have returned to normal on doing a lot of other things, but it's surprising that we haven't returned more to normal on office related items yeah. just because maybe we, people hate commuting, but I don't know, to me, that just never strikes me as very low, but that's just me. Actually, I thought it was high. <laughs> Just really? Anecdotally, among my, you know, people I, I do, I, I, I spend time with, I, I don't think a third of them are going into the office regularly. Really? I would say I was closer to 50, but that's me. Um, and I'm curious if others have on the, you know, have other thoughts, but I know. Uh, anyway, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you have a better sense for this than I do. I just, it's just surprising yeah. to me. And then I got, like I said, rush hour is returned. In full, I don't know if it's a function of the fact that rush hour is back, but people aren't in public transit. Um, you know, I don't know whether or not, you know, and like I said, anecdotally on the weekend, it seems like people are, you go to a shopping mall, people are back at a shopping mall. You look at things. It's interesting that a lot of aspects of our lives are returning. Our kids are going to, you know, soccer matches and a whole bunch of other stuff. And we're resuming our lives in one area, but we're not resuming it in another. And there's no doubt that it's significantly lower or down from where it was. I just, this just yeah. struck me as a lot lower than I would have expected. So um, we've got about five minutes um, yeah. left. Is there anything, uh, questions that people have? I know that just as an FYI that um, um, Brian did put the link to the um, nightlife survey in the chat bar. So if you wanted to go retrieve that, you could go grab that. Um, if, you're, you know, if there's other final questions for Adam as a wrap up, or is there anything people you know, want to add or say or? Bob, I did want to say one thing, which is that um, based on a lot of the conversations I've had with chamber board members, when we have 57 board members, that's a lot of different kinds of companies. And not all of them, uh, many of them thought that they were going to bring people back to the office full time after Labor Day. That's mm -hmm. what they said in May. That at Labor Day, they said, oh, maybe around Thanksgiving. Then they pushed it to January. Yeah. Uh, vaccine requirements are an issue. So I think there's some other factors at work that we sure. haven't addressed here, of oh, course. Of course. Um, and so we're not going to see it, but like you, and I think we've talked about this in our own uh, conversations, which is we see people out and about, the malls are busy, uh, I see more people in restaurants in the evening than during the day. So people are definitely out having experiences. And I think that whether it's retail or it's going back into the office, I think there's a whole other whole conversation about what is the experience in the office. And, and what things uh, now are more efficient, not in the office than were in the office. I mean, there's just a lot. Uh, that of change that I think some of right. it's going to stay and some of it not. I don't know. I go to the office, uh, you know, pretty much once a week and um, the building's not, not that full. <laughs> I don't see that many people yet. Yeah. Just pointing that out. What's happening, I think, this is Gus Ballman at Beverage and Diamond. Um, from the observations that everyone's making, what, what I've noticed and what's going on at my firm and our offices here and around the country is that where you have corporate decisions being made by large companies and large buildings, things are still shut down and everyone's planning to reopen candidly in the January to February period. A lot of this is keyed off to the vaccine for children because the whole child care issue is an enormous piece of everything we're talking about in terms of reopening. And that is huge, enormous in terms of the workforce, child care. And it's going to be different and everyone's grappling with it. So I think that's a big reason why what we see from an institutional framework, we see things are moving very slow in terms of reopening. In terms of individual decision making, it's what everyone here is commenting on when it's a person yes they're going to the restaurant they're going to the store they're going to the soccer game 
And so we have that dissonance between the big institutional decisions being made and the smaller individual decisions. But so much of everything we're talking about, from everything I'm being told here and around the country in our various offices and with our clients, it's child care. What to do about child care and what's going to be the future of child care. So I just wanted to make that quick comment. Yeah. I think it's probably right. I want to um, thank Bob for arranging this presentation by Adam, which has been fascinating. I want to, of course, thank Adam. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Adam's company over the years in a variety of projects, and it's everything that Bob said. Um, they were always terrific. Um, Adam, I used to work with Lynn Bogorad. I know. Um, yeah, and um, 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 and our relationship went back decades um, when I was at the Park and Planning Commission in Montgomery and Prince George's County, and Lynn advised us on certain things we were doing, and then when I entered the private sector. So um, Lynn was a senior person at Adams Company and tragically died not too long ago, um, yeah. uh, but it's a frustrating... Not from yeah, COVID, but but sadly, I mean, not a young, you know, not. Oh, it wasn't COVID, right, right. But, too young but again, as Bob said, um, Adam's company, very helpful. We're at the 10 o'clock hour. I just want to note to the uh, committee and to everyone who's joined us today, besides thanking Adam so much for this terrific uh, conversation, um, that our meeting on December the 14th, we've asked the team that is building, well, Scratch that. We've asked the, the, the team that has been retained by the state of Maryland to uh, build the I-495, I-270 project um, to come in and speak with us about the project. Um, so that will be the program on the morning of December the 14th, that joint venture group who has been um, chosen by the state for that project. Uh, uh, and before I close out, I just want to ask if Bob or Gigi or Brian wish to say anything else, but we do like to try to stay on schedule for the benefit of our speaker and everyone else. I just no, want to just... say thank you to Adam and thank you, uh, Bob, for organizing this and, and Gus as always. But Adam, this was terrific. A lot of food for thought. Thank you for joining us. And I want to thank yeah. everybody who signed on this morning and spent their morning with us. Yep. And uh, Adam, again, thank you for doing this. We appreciate it. Um, we also appreciate your willingness to sorry, have this recorded. And obviously, Gigi and Brian, great session here today. And obviously, something we can share with the membership more broadly, they can watch on their own leisure as well. So thank, thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a great thank day. you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.